name's Derek Bailey. I've been a wood turner now for over 40 years off and on and taught for the last eight of them. Uh, with that in mind, I thought I'll, I'll start a course on, the, on YouTube from uh, entry level wood turners right through to intermediate level. Uh, beyond that, there's plenty of wood turners around that can show you specific skills and specialise in certain aspects of wood turning, whether it's bowl turning or uh, excellent ways of using certain tools and chisels. But I just concentrate on beginners up to intermediate level, which will involve copy turning and, and reaching a skill that you'll be able to take it up as a hobby or perhaps even take it up to start up a business in wood turning or uh, get an income from it. Anyway, uh, I'll start off with introducing the lathe, the tools that we'll be using to begin with and involving uh, keeping on top of the traditional tools which will be the predominant uh, subject of, the, of all the lessons to come. Uh, but we'll start off with three basic traditional tools. Anyway, enough waffling, let's get on. Well first, let's have a look at the lathe. This is an Axminster AW205WL, which is a lovely little lathe which has got a reverse motor on it and a handle at the end of the headstock. Now, uh, I have been through on my previous videos, I've gone into detail about the lathe, the setting up, etc. So I don't feel I need to go through that again. So we'll start off with the actual height of the lathe. Now, if you can imagine an invisible line going from the tailstock to the headstock, and you stand vertically with the nub of your elbow on a line, on that line, then that should be the correct height for you, regardless of how tall or, or small you are. And it is, it, is, it is convenient to do that for the simple reason that once you get the tools, the approach angles and everything else become set in second nature if you're used to dealing with a lathe at that height. It makes it easier to, to approach the, the wood with the correct angle of the tool and because it corresponds with the, the correct height of the lathe. If you can, uh, I like to have a, a light at the top, a magnetic light in this point, because when you're doing bowl turning or, or deep holes, you need to be able to see inside the hole when you're using the when you when you're cutting the wood. So now, let's have a look at the tools. For those who have been uh, watching my previous videos, most of the videos were involved in using carbide tip tools or carbide inserts, which you can interchange when uh, you don't have to grind them, you just replace them when they're worn, simply by unscrewing the top screw and, and purchasing another one and fitting it. And there are essentially three types. Of the carbide tip tools is a straight, uh, the round and the detail. Now that we're moving over to traditional tools, we need to replace those or certainly have a comparison with those with the traditional tools. <coughs> now the spindle roughing gouge is used to reduce square wood to round. And that would take the place of square end tool, carbide tip tool, and also the uh, round nose tip tool. The parting tool is essentially a thin version of the square uh, carbide tip tool. And the spindle gouge, which this is a half inch spindle gouge, will take the place of the detail and the round nut and the square nose. Right, in order to make the square wood nice and round, I'm going to use the spindle roughing gouge. Now this looks quite a hefty tool. 
and it is quite deceptive, it's not. It's only as strong as what we call this tang that goes into the handle and it's very thin metal. And the actual tool itself has just been getting a straight piece of metal and bend it, forging it or bending it round. And then the grind is straight across the top. And there the bevel, which is crucial in most of wood turning tools, traditional wood turning tools, is that that creates a pivot point and helps us to introduce the edge, the cutting edge of the tool onto the wood. And we use that as a fulcrum. And, the, and because of the leverage involved, we can get very, very precise cutting uh, removal of wood due to the distance between the tool and the fulcrum as it's on the tool rest. And what we do, we introduce to start with, most beginners to start with, you put the tool on the tool rest, round about 30 degrees, and then you slowly push over the tool rest, keeping your fingers behind it, until the bevel touches the real rotating wood, so you get a ticking action. You're not cutting then, and by raising the handle, you introduce the edge to the wood. Once you see slivers of wood coming off the edge, then you can move and I'll get to the actual movement and cutting action in a moment. Now the problem with this tool is that people think it's because it's substantial you can use it for bowl turning. Please do not use it for bowl turning because it's only thin metal here it can snap very easily in the forces involved when you're turning bowls. The ideal tool for that is a bowl turning gouge which we'll come to in another lesson. So this is only to be used on spindle turning, which is basically that, where the grain of the wood is parallel to the lathe, like so. Bowl turning is when the grain of the wood is at 90 degrees to the lathe. And that's when it can get dangerous because the tool will dig into the end grain and pull chunks out. If you're lucky, it pulls chunks out of the wood and not you. So we, it's now been, it used to be called the roughing gouge, but now it's, it's called the spindle roughing gouge for obvious reasons, only to be used on spindle turning. Right. The stamps that we need to uh, uh, acquire before we start, wood, well, when, when, while we're doing wood turning, especially with using the bowl gouge, we need to stand with our legs, and the distance between our feet at the bottom is, is about the same width as our shoulders. So we've got a nice straight line. And we, uh, we approach the wood with our handle about 30 degrees, as I mentioned earlier. And we push through, we put our fingers on top of the tool rest and push through our fingers with the fingers behind the tool rest and we push through until we touch the wood. Once we achieve our torque, which I'll take you through, uh, I'll show a better view of it when I'm actually turning. Once we achieve a cutting action on the wood and the chips are coming, we actually pivot from our back foot to our front foot, with the front foot slightly in front of the back foot. Which well, best way to show you is here, I think. So that we have this foot slightly in front of your back foot, so that we can pivot backwards and forwards like that. If the back foot is there and you're moving there, you're out of balance, and that foot ends up adjusting accordingly. So you need to put that front foot in front of your back foot so you can pivot backwards and forwards and you actually do a dance. You do not move your arms away from your body. You, your arms and your hands are there to p position the tool on the tool rest and to feel the cutting action of the wood. Your body and the movement with your legs makes you do a nice, steady, even cut through the length of the timber. If you're using your arms away from your body, you have less control over the cutting action and you will get staggered cuts 
an uneven cut so I wonder why it's not one simple movement, uh, one simple cut through the length of the timber which you can see on many videos. You will see the person moving the body. And once you start incorporating other movements with, with the spindle gouge and the parting tool, you will start to move and lift your, lift your body away and pivot on the, on, the balls of, on the balls of your feet. And in other words, by combining all those movements with the body, you actually do a dance. And when I was wood turning and making staircase spindles, and if you were to take a picture of me, you would see me doing a dance like that. And your muscle memory comes into play as you're doing all the different curved and concave and beads, etc. and elements of the, of the spindle. To start with, I'm going to use some uh, deal or pine. Uh, it's quite cheap wood, you can pick some up at a joiner or, or if you've a joiner done some work, ask him to leave some offcuts behind. It's great stuff to practice on and if you can get a good finish on this, you can probably get a good finish on anything. Uh, what I've done, which you've probably seen in, in uh, previous videos, I've drawn a cross at the end Put a dimple in so that it's easy to locate the uh, the drive centre and the revolving centre. There we have the teeth of the drive centre bedding in there. And of course the depression caused by a centre punch. So that we can locate it in the lathe. Now we've got the wood in the lathe. We've tested it to see if there's any movement. Just a little bit of movement there. Just tighten that up a little bit more. Right. It's nice and solid. So when we position the tool rest, we position it on the centre height of the lathe, roughly to start with. And we leave a gap of the about a pencil width. But what I like to do, especially with beginners, is that always project the tool rest beyond the end of the timber because when you're using the tool you can see the rest underneath it's very easy to get caught up in the moment of removing wood and you come straight off the end of your tool rest nothing to fear but it's a little unnerving when it happens so what I like to do is I like to project it for about 25 millimeters beyond the end of the timber and we turn roughly three quarters of the timber, getting rid of the nasty edges, which can be a finger trapper, but you should never ever put your finger beyond the tool rest anyway. And then when we've done that, we move the tool rest over and repeat that projection at the opposite end of the timber. And this is the face visor. They're quite cheap, under 10 pounds, from usually from screw fix or somewhere like that and they're perfectly adequate they have a nice protection for the face and cover the whole face so we're ready to go right now I'll switch the lathe on make sure it rotates without hitting the tool rest stand back then I approached the, uh, with the tool at about 30 degrees like I mentioned before and pushed through like that and you can hear that ticking noise I'm not actually cutting yet so I raise the handle up slowly until I see chips coming off the end of the tool and then I move my body one with the tool forwards like that we can get a constant cut. No moving my arms like that but no moving it with the arms. Your arms and hands are there to position the tool against the rotating wood. Now that we've taken a bit of wood off we can speed up a little bit because it's running concentrically. 
again low down let the bevel the heel of the bevel touch the wood raise the handle to get the cup <coughs> then go forward and backwards pivoting on your feet and moving your body and arms together not in defended way Stop the leg now, and we'll move the leg, we'll move the tool rest further up, so that we have a projection here again beyond the end of the wood. The same applies. It doesn't matter if we hold, if we round all together yet. Low down, touch the wood with the heel of the bevel, raise the handle, and then backwards and forward. Now you see how the gaps widen now between the tool rest and the, and the wood. We can now bring it up closer. And now we'll make it com completely around the full length of the wood. As you can see this is only a small motor. Uh, this is only a small motor on this way, and yet it's still powerful enough to be a reasonably fast cut. A little trick to test the wood, you can put the, the fall of the uh, tool on there, if it's still ticking it means it's not quite round. There it's smooth, there it's ticking a little bit. Even so, we still use the same approach. We always get into that habit of raising the handle to get the cut and then move. And once we've achieved that, we can rotate the tool slightly to get a slightly better cut using the straight part. The straight part of the uh, tool. Don't know if you can see that. We can rotate the tool slightly. And stop the leg now and it's a little bit rough it's not a bad finish but we can improve that finish by rotating the tool and putting it putting it down slightly we can create a shearing action and again I'm, I'm leaning back into the cup with my body, I'm not moving, you notice that my arms are not moving independently of, the, of my body. I'll have a look at the finish and you can see the finish is a little better. There is a video showing a, a, a guy using the, uh, using the uh, roughing out gouge totally to do beads etc. I'll try and find it and put it in the... Uh, in the description a link to the video in the description see how even that cut is that's because I'm leaning with my body towards the cut you get reasonably smooth finish Now there are two types of parting tools, there's the plain type, again we have a, a bevel, but it's quite a long one this time, which is plain on both sides and the thickness is at the bottom and the top are exactly the same. We have a diamond parting tool, if you notice there's a line that goes down the centre of the tool. And if you look at the uh, end you can see that the top and the bottom are thinner than the middle. And that's when you go and plunge into the wood, there's less friction on the whole, on the whole thickness of the tool. And just the friction is only, only happens along that, along that line. Which makes it easier. And, and uh, <clears throat> so when we, uh, I'm going to clear the end up here now.
Now when I put the tool down here, again the same principle as I did with the spindle roughing gouge, I gently kiss the wood and raise the handle to get a cut. And then as I approach the, the wood, I push through my fingers here. Push right through my fingers and as I'm going, I raise the handle continuously until I approach the middle. And it, it, it moves in an arc. So I'm, I'm uh, slicing the wood off at the top and then raising the handle slowly and continuously and aiming for the centre of the wood. So by the time I've got into the middle of the wood I'm virtually through the centre. You can at attempt it going straight in horizontally like this but if you've got to force it more. And the finish on the wood isn't as good. What I usually do is I usually start, if I'm going to put a groove in, I usually start it horizontal, the two with the tool horizontal, just to scour the surface, and then I raise, then I go further up and cut the wood at high, at a slightly higher pot, slightly higher than centre, and then I can go in. That way I can stop the wood from fraying. I haven't quite understood the science behind it. But if you plunge in horizontally for a half a millimeter, you stop the wood from fraying either side of the cut. Right, I'll just clean up the other side of the wood here and make it slightly. You can see it's running slightly out. Again, you start low. I can start there. I'm not making a groove, so it doesn't matter. I'll stop the lathe after this. And you will see, if you look here, there's no fraying. If you look here, because I started the cut higher up, for some reason it started fraying. I've, met, I've, I've intended to try and find out why it's doing that. But if I'd have started horizontally, I wouldn't have had that fraying on the, on the edge of the wood. So now we've cleaned up the wood. Our next stage now is to mark out salient points where we're going to do two beads and two coves. So I'm going to make some lines while it's rotating. Two, four sections. One, two, so we have four sections now. And with the parting tool I'm going to plunge in, just, take, just bring that out a bit so that I'm not resting on that uh, on the bevel part I'm resting on the horizontal part of the tool so we start there to stop that fraying and then I push forward raise the handle until I get a cut now what I found with beginners was they tended to push too much and what happens when you push you lift the tool off the rest and then when you do get it the right angle to cut it the, the hits the wood and the wood brings it down and it bangs on this thing which I what I like to call a Hobart Simpson moment and do when it hits the tool rest don't worry about it it's just that you've you've not approached the, the wood at the correct angle so don't force it up or else you'll if you're not getting a cut keep raising the handle don't push to the temptation for beginners is is to push hard if they're not getting a cut trying to force the wood, the, the metal into the wood. You, to get a cut, you raise the handle. Don't push. You only push when you start getting a cut. So raise the handle. Can you see wood coming off? Then we can plunge in. If you find it's jumping a little bit, just ease off. And then withdraw the tool exactly the way it went in. Slip, cut. See how it's jumping, just relax there to slow down your throw. You can speed up a little bit to stop that jumping. So we're four sections now. 
So that's the parting tool. So we've learnt two movements now. We've learnt horizontal movement and maintaining that angle of the tool against the body. Now we've started introducing a second movement which is raising the handle and pushing through our fingers. Like so. And created these four sections. Now finally the third tool we're going to use is the spindle gouge. This is a half inch spindle gouge. And what we use this for, we have, we have three uh, movements in this one. We have the pushing through our fingers, the raising of the handle, but we create a twisting moment now. And what we have is, uh, we have what I like to call the sweet spot. I don't know if you can see that. I'll mark it with my pencil. So as we twist, I'll just move this to a rest over here. As we twist, if you look at that sweet spot, that sweet spot will continue right through the wood. No matter where you put that tool on the wood, if that sweet spot is cut, you will get a cut. Even when you're doing straight cuts, it's usually all that sweet spot when you're cutting in that direction and the sweet spot moves around to the other side when you're cutting from right to left. I'll indicate that more on the, on the video. And what we do here, again we rest the wood, I'm going to do a bead. So, again we rest the bevel, the bevel again like we did with the roughing gouge, rough spindle roughing gouge, we raise the handle until we get a cut, but instead of starting in the middle of the section, we'll just nibble away at the ends and twist and raise, if you notice I'm raising my handle, and if you can see where that sweet spot is, is what's cutting the wood. And if you can maintain that spot, sweet spot, you will get a curve. And by maintaining that, you can maintain a constant cut. By looking at the sweet spot and keeping it on that part of the tool. I'm hoping you can see this. Is jumping a little bit because I'm raising the tool a little high. See how I'm feeling for the cut because I'm using the bevel like I would a finger and I'm feeling for the cut. Wood turning is about feel, it's not about cutting from using your vision. Blind people can turn because they can feel the resistance of the cut against the cutting edge. Wood turning is a gentle art, especially with spindle turning, where you actually feel the cut. So if you're gripping the tool hard like that and rigid, you will not get any decent feedback from the cutting action. It's all about understanding the friction, the resistance of the cut. And see how I'm lifting my body and I'm moving my body round with the curve. I'm not stuck back here and trying to do it here. I can't see what's happening. My body's away from the tool. Bring your body up close. You go as near as the wood as you can and move your body round with the cut. So that when you start the cut, the flute, which is the, the groove at the top, is looking at you and when you finish the cut, it's facing towards you. And you can see the beads slowly forming now. And then it's a case of just gently kissing the wood each time. You notice I'm using the sweet spot again. See how small that cut is. 
once you get practice you can maintain that depth of cut all the way around the curve by very going very slow the more slow you're going in wood turning the quicker you learn taking notice of the cut all the time I'm just blending that in now see how little I'm taking off it doesn't take a lot to alter the shape <clears throat> right I've put the camera in a different position and I'll repeat what I showed you in the other in the other camera position I'll repeat it now on the top so again we're nibbling at the corners hopefully you can see the sweet spot as I talked about before which is approximately there and I'm raising the handle so I'm the flute is looking at me and I'm slowly raising the handle twisting and push, pushing through my fingers slightly If you can see it's a constant cut all the way down it's a constant movement you don't stop we'll do the other side which is again we've moved the sweet spot round to the other side just past center touch the bevel raise the handle until you get a cut then you can move See how I'm lifting my body up and pivoting, well I don't, well I don't think you can see my feet, but what I'm doing I'm bringing my body round as I do the curve. My arms are not away from my body, I'm using my body to absorb the vibration. coming round until we just blend that in there like so. Have a look at it, see if I've got a, a reasonably con even curve on both sides from centre. See how I can just play until I touch the wood, until I've got a cut. It's all about feel, feeling the cut. Not thinking too heavily about what you're doing. Just go for the feel. The tendency is, that, especially beginners, is to go through the motions without thinking about the feel of the cut. And they just, and what happens is they, they turn the tool, the tool edge comes away and they don't know what to do. And what they do, they start playing about trying to get a cut and they end up taking a cut on that side with the bevel well away from the wood and not resting on. You see, the bevel prevents you taking big deep cuts. If, you, if the bevel is in, in mid-air, facing the wrong way, you'll get a catch and you get a big chunk taken out. So always have the bevel rubbing. If you can see and look down the top there, you'll see that the bevel is virtually following the curve. That it isn't. It's just like putting a knife edge towards the edge of the wood. The bevel is there to rub behind the cut and create a little sheen or, or finish. See how I'm taking it very slow. It's not a, you're not rushing, it's not a race to finish this. You're learning the cutting action. Then we'll just take that line off. See, I'm, I'm actually out of practice because once you, once you get into the routine and your muscle memory kicks in, you'll be able to do a bead within a few cuts. I'm just taking a few, a few cuts to get the effect. And there we have our two beads. Uh, later on, we'll do two calves, and then I'll show you how to how to use this to cut straight. And use the parting tool to clean up the wood at a later stage. Okay, well we've done the beads now, we're going to do coves.
uh, which is the opposite to what I showed you how to do the bead. Uh, I'll switch the machine on. This time we start with the flute if we're cutting in from this side into the middle. So we start with the flute facing that way. And we start roughly in the middle. And we swing the handle away from the wood and push the handle down. We do the same at the other side. And again you can see the sweet spot as I mentioned earlier on the bead, just the same comes into play. And all the time the bevel's rubbing on the curve as we go in. And then we gradually move across the wood, either side, And meet in the middle. Now here, what's happening, we get a lump at the bottom of the curve. So rather than take it round and go upwards, when we're cutting wood with the, in the spindle gowns, we never go uphill. We always cut downhill. So, where, so it's a, great, a case of just by process of elimination, we gradually work that lump away until we can create a smooth transition. Start, start again here. If you notice that the the edge of the tool is in a at 90 degrees or slightly tilted and the more we bring round here the more aggressive the curve is. See, as I come round here, we can make a more aggressive curve. Again, I'm using my body to swing the tool round. And then process of elimination. We blend and make sure we've got a nice curve at the bottom. Just match that up a little bit. See how the sweet spot's coming into play. It's more apparent here now that the flute's open. And there we have, and here we have a large knot which is quite attractive. Wood turners like knots, especially when they're uh, sound knots. That's getting a bit loose here, but uh, they can be quite attractive. Can the uh, can the features, especially in pine? Okay. After that, now I'll, I'll do a combination now. Whereas we can start off here and do a bead, one side of a bead, and turn it into a cord. going uphill, I stop there, I don't come round, I meet at the bottom and blend it in. And I'm swinging my body round. Whatever position I'm putting that tool in, my body follows behind. As I said earlier, my hands are not, my arms are not away from my body. I'm using my body to generate the curve. My arms and hand are there just to position the tool against the wood. Right, so that's basically the curves. Uh, now we're going to use this tool to do straight parts. 
so as you can see I've got some straight bits along the top here and some at the bottom which I can't get to so what I do is slightly tilt it and again the bevel's rubbing at the back the handle's low and I just just shear across like that So I'm actually creating a slightly shearing action. For this, for this you don't, it doesn't particularly matter which sweet spot you use. I can do it the other way if I want. That gives us our straight cut. Very similar to uh, the spindle roughing gouge. Although it's a different shape altogether, the grind is a different shape. And it should give a better finish than the spindle roughing gouge. There we have it. Now to clean the bottom of the curve here, we can use our parting tool and we can just gently push forward like that and just move it from side to side acting more like a scraper and that way we can clean the bottom we can also use it slightly tilted and this is where I'll be showing you in a later video the actual screw chisel but it's a similar principle I can use the parting tool to come across like that I've slightly tilted the parting tool as you can see and we get a shearing action again a lot of uh, the tools often overlap in, uh, in treatment sometimes you get lazy can't be bothered to get a, a go and get a uh, a spindle gouge so you, you just make do with the parting tool just to touch up things see I'm just using the point of the party of the parting tool just raising the handle each time if I'm not getting a cut I don't push onto the wood I raise the handle and because we have that leverage, because we have that, we have, uh, <coughs> we can adjust minute, make a minute adjustment because of the length of the handle. We can make, my, we can possibly go to a few thousandths of an inch in accuracy. Now I'll just sort of clean up the two. See how I'm uh, using the bevel to feel against the ward and introducing the edge slowly I can hear it starting to cut any second now there we go I'll just clean up that bottom and that again here I'm feeling using the bevel to feel the, the wood and then slowly bringing the handle round until I can see the edge coming into play and there we have it there And then, as we've got a little line there, I can simply gently kiss that wood, raising the handle until I get a cut. Again, I'm using the bevel, even in the parting tool, I'm touching the wood with the bevel. I don't try and get a cut straight away, I work my way towards the cut. I'll just dock to this, uh, this shape here, it's just slightly out of proportion on that right side. So I'll just uh, take a little more off the side, again I'm feeling for the cut. Don't press. Just 
concrete, just taking the wood off. The whole art of wood turning is removing the wood that you want to remove. Here I'm uh, just struggling a bit because the thickness of the tool now is stopping. So I'm going to get a smaller tool. <coughs> Same principle, it's, this is a slightly different grind on this uh, spindle gouge. This is a quarter inch spindle gouge and I can get into that. See again, I'm feeling for the cut. And then we can even up there, slightly higher. So I'll just... Uh, Lower that a little bit, that's why the curve's slightly out of proportion. When you're copy turning or wanting to reproduce these constantly, your muscle memory comes into play. And that's evened it up, that's evened the curve up a little bit there. We've got a reasonable uh, silky sheen on the wood due to the uh, bevel rubbing the behind the cut and burnishing the wood slightly. Well now I'm going to try <laughs> and get a decent finish on this piece of pine. And we can use abrasives for this. Okay, and the next stage is to put a finish on the on the wood. Uh, well, the first thing we we're going to use abrasives. Um, this is uh, Abrinet. Uh, there is other makes about now. It, it was a sole provider. Abrinet was the sole maker of these abrasives. Um, most of you have probably done decorating at, at home and that sort of thing. You've got what we call sandpaper or glass paper which is what it is it's uh, a medium of paper with a, an adhesive and a load of glass particles sprayed on top of it uh, it's no good for wood turning because a, it tends to stain the wood particularly in pine and it soon wears out uh, when I started wood turning there was a thing uh, for wood turners used to uh, use what we call garnet paper which was an orange colour and there was really only that about, apart from uh, wet and dry, which you've probably heard, of, which is uh, silicon carbide. And that tends to be on paper that um, cracks when you, when you bend them. Uh, the garnet paper did have a, a latex backing and it was flexible, so you could mould it to the shapes of the element that you've turned. Uh, you can get most abrasives at uh, B&Q and the multi-stores, but they tend not to specialise in abrasives for wood turners, they're general abrasives. So you have to go to specialist suppliers on the whole to get things like Abrinet. And it is a mesh, it's not solid paper, so it, it doesn't wear out as fast. In fact, it probably lasts about 10 to 20 times longer than a paper-backed or a latex-backed abrasive. And it is a mesh, you can see through it, but the beauty of it is, when you use it, and it, it doesn't, it, when it gets clogged up, you give it a flick, and uh, the dust comes away from it, and you can re and you can use it far longer than ordinary paper-based abrasives. Now I'm going to use this, but there is an alternative if if you're worried about dust. And now dust is inevitable uh, wood turning, and uh, I use. Some people use quite an expensive respirator, which is probably the ultimate protection against dust but it's not quite as convenient to use you've got to replace the filters and you've got to put batteries in them etc uh, I tend to use this American one it's been on the market now for uh, oh must be 20 years or so 
and it is a plastic membrane and the folds have to face downwards for the more sufficient usage and now you put it on the top of your head like that and it has a velcro attachment at the back put it over your nose obviously and the beauty of it is it doesn't affect my voice too much so I often use this when I was uh, demonstrating because it didn't affect my the tone of my voice you probably you may wish I, I did have something that affected, <laughs> affected the tone of my voice but that's by the way so <clears throat> we're going to use the abrasives and I'll take you through each one. They are numbered. Uh, yeah, I think you can get some at uh, 60 grit. Uh, the lower the number, the coarser the cut. And they work. you can work your way down to, I think the maximum is 600 grit. Although 320 is probably the finest you go to, especially on pine. The denser hardwoods, you can go a lot more uh, because it, it, uh, it can benefit from very fine abrasives. But open grain timbers like pine, uh, ash, etc. Tend to, tend to not be improved much after 320-400 grit. Right, I've taken the tool rest out because it's always advisable to take the tool rest out when you're using abrasives. You don't want to inadvertently catch your hand or trap it on there. Something may happen and bang your hand back onto the tool rest. So here, uh, I think we'll start at what, 120 grit. That's usually the one to start at. If, you've, uh, if you're using uh, 60 or 80 grit, that's because you haven't quite acquired the skill of the tool yet and there are lots of bumps. And all this abrasive does, you do have tool marks. You can see slight facets on the curves. And that's all the abrasive does, is gets, gets rid of the facets. So, and because it's because you can bend it, it's a cutting tool like anything else. And you can see how we've got sharp defined changes in direction. We've got a straight, and there's a definite demarcation line there, separating the two elements. And we don't want to destroy that. Uh, we, we, we need, a, I, I prefer to have sharp transitions of, of direction, which can be visibly seen. If I start using the abrasives and start blurring the, the corners there, it becomes unsightly, in my opinion. So we can, put, it's a cutting tool like anything else. So it has a, it's no good just wishy-washy going over the top like that and just messing about. You put your fingers where you want the cut to take place and gently, you don't have to press on. Just allow the, the uh, abrasive to do its work. You notice the sheen goes away now because we're actually cutting the wood. This is where it comes into its own. We can So here, making a nice matte finish now and it's evening or it's taking away all the facets left by the tool and here we've got a con concave section so we make this into like a, a round file if you like and go up to the edge not over it doesn't need a lot a lot of the pupils this is quite cathartic is this experience and a lot of people people get uh, pupils usually get fixated on a, a braces and be, they'd there, be there for about five or ten minutes just gently using the abrasives if we want a straight bit then we just Just caress the wood, we don't have to press on too much. We don't have to do it a lot. Again, I'm making a fire let to get back into the bottom there. See how I'm shaping the, the abrasive to suit the element that I'm, that I'm smoothing. Again up to the edge, we try not to go over the edge. 
Let's fit in there nicely. And that's sufficient. That's 120 grit. Right, off, instead of watching me sanding away like mad, uh, I'll uh, switch the camera off and come back when I've gone down to 320. Right, now I'm down to 320 grit now. Stop the lathe and see what it's like. There we go. All the facets are taken out. We've got a reasonable finish now. So we can further enhance it by reverting to good old sawdust. Uh, we don't we don't throw anything away, wood turners. We keep sawdust. Right, we get some good old kitchen towel. Get the sawdust we've made. Switch the lathe on, speed it up a little bit, and then we'll just burnish quite firm pressure. And you can see a sheen coming up now. There it is, quite nice. Right, <coughs> so next we're going to put a finish on now, so we're going to put some sanding sealer on. Right, this is cellulose sanding sealer. Uh, I wouldn't breathe it in too much, uh, else you won't be able to drive home or anywhere. You can get acrylic sanding sealer, uh, which isn't as potent to breathe in, but it, it tends to dry very slowly, whereas cellulose sanding sealer dries within a few, and within at least a minute. And what I do is I put it on by hand, I don't switch the lathe on. It gives it time to fill up the pores of the wood. If you just, if you just switch the lathe on and just put it against the wood, the wood it just skims across the top and doesn't penetrate the fibres of the wood. Now the sanding seal has had time to dry I put some more sawdust again and just burnish it again That sheen comes back again. So each time the, the finish is getting better and better. Now we're going to put a wax on. Uh, this is a specialist wood turner's wax. It's a combina it's uh, carnauba wax basically, but with a bit of beeswax shoved in to just make it a little bit softer. Uh, pure carnauba wax, which comes from the leaves of palm trees, I believe, is a little bit too hard, so they soften it up by introducing some beeswax. So we don't, there's not, a, we don't put a lot on. We just gently skim across the surface. We don't usually put, uh, I don't, I don't usually put um, wax on anything above. 75 millimeter three inches diameter because it can get lost and become streaky Less is more with this you don't want over I mean it lasts for ages 
Then we get our tissue again and we make a pad so we don't warm our fingers up. And we melt the wax and spread it along the, uh, along the profiles. So we press quite firmly and bring it along like that. And you can see the line moving across as I spread the wax. The wax comes out on here. <clears throat> and there you have the bumpy shiny stick, as I like to call it. And that's the first exercise in wood turning and we've covered all three elements we've covered a concave a convex which is a bead a concave which is a curve and straight bits in reducing this square piece of wood to a cylinder so all those three elements are what comprise wood turning and it's those combinations you can put a curve on a bead, a bead on a curve, a straight bit on a bead, a straight bit in, in different widths, different lengths, different depths. And it's amazing how a small bead can make something more attractive or a little, a little square, a little flat portion on the way. And you look at, uh, you look at some of the antique furniture, the chairs, etc. and see the detail that's gone into them and the small detail and they can become quite attractive and classic in design. So that's basically the first lesson. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you again. <laughs>